Welcome to Rotary and Serving Our Community. Today I've got a very uh, special program, something that's unique to uh, the programs we've done in the past. I'm going to take you on one of the trips with me um, to Honduras. I was uh, assigned to go to Honduras by the Rotary Foundation to take a look at some uh, water projects there. I've been involved doing water projects for probably about 10 years now and have done water projects in six different countries, probably benefiting close to uh, 100,000 people. What I'd like to do is share with you on this one why we as Rotarians do this. To start with, the Rotary Foundation takes a look at doing um, areas of focus. In other words, we have six specific areas of focus that we try to uh, focus on. Peace and conflict resolution, disease prevention and treatment, water and sanitation, maternal and child health, basic education and literacy, and community and economic development. As a cadre, um, I work with the Rotary Foundation as a technical expert, a volunteer technical expert, and what we take a look at doing is actually going in and evaluating some of these projects to make sure that they are effective and that the money is spent wisely and in the right direction. The ultimate goal is to make sure that we as Rotarians use our money and investments the best we can to benefit humanity and mankind. So, here we go. About a week ago, two weeks ago, I was sent into Honduras, the city of San Pedro Sula, to take a look at a number of water projects. This is the team that went with me when I say that. They met me there. They're the local people. If you notice the gentleman to my right uh, carrying the machete, he was our guide. And believe me, uh, you need machetes in some of the areas that we went to. Areas are very remote there. And we were taking a look at doing water projects and seeing how effective they were. Now realize that water is only available in, as safe drinking water in 20% of, of the world. 80% of the rest of this world suffers from questionable to very bad water. This area was no exception. Because it was lacking infrastructure over the number of years and the way it was developed, we felt that this was going to be an effective way to bring safe drinking water to the communities that live up on this mountain, the mountain of uh, Merendon. The other gentlemen with me are members of the Water Committee and also um, the local Rotary Club, the Rotary Club of San Pedro Sula. Some of the areas it looks like, I mean, it's a beautiful area. We traveled up by four by fours to the top of the mountains there, and you can see um, the forestation that we have there, very tropical, very warm, very humid. And the houses, as you can see in the lower corner there, was very difficult to see. Yeah, these houses are covered by jungle, some of the trees reaching 40, 50 feet in height, so you can't see any of these houses. This is another picture of one of the peaks, one of the areas there, and you'll notice that it looks like it's being farmed. Well, those are uh, actually coffee beans being grown on this mountain there. There's a lot of, uh, I would say, organized business that would take a look at uh, bringing in coffee as one of the uh, prime pro, uh, produce uh, areas of the, air, of the world. A view from atop the mountain. This is uh, San Pedro down in the bottom. By the way, that is the second largest city in Honduras. And the forest as we look from one of the mountain tops. It's a beautiful area again. And uh, this mountain range is actually a preserve. It's uh, controlled, protected. There's only about 4,000 people that live there. In 1998, I believe, it was declared a preserve um, sanctuary by the government of Honduras. And what they did then was to try and protect the area by not allowing any more growth within the forested areas. This is to protect the watersheds because the water from here eventually goes down to uh, the city where there is their main water source. This is a picture of a uh, water tank. This water tank was um, donated by the Rotary Clubs um, of actually Washington, uh, state of Washington. And this supplies and serves over 100 families. This water system itself starts with, starts with um, water coming from a mountain spring and eventually going down into this, uh, this tank. From there, it's distributed downwards down the mountain to the 100 villages, uh, I'm sorry, families. Here's a picture of um, the, one of the filters, and this filter actually is one of the home filters. It has in it different aggregate sizes. It goes from gravel to uh, smaller gravel, pea gravel in size, 
and then eventually to sand, and that sand actually filters the water out. This becomes the biological catch for most of the impurities within the water system itself. And again, each of the homes have these. There's about 100 homes that have these in place right now on this one particular project. The other project has another 350, same exact water system. We um, went around to the different houses and take a look at these. On a regular occasion, the gentleman taking the picture here actually is in charge of evaluating and making sure that these water systems stay active in place and are well maintained on a weekly basis. So he goes to all of these areas by four by four and by horse uh, because of the difficulty of getting into these different areas. One of the uh, women uh, of the village, this is her system. Is, she's showing us how well the system actually works. This lady here has a, a family of three. They have three young children. And before this, the system went in, which was about four years ago, the children were constantly sick. They were malnutritioned and they had problems with waterborne diseases on a daily basis. With this in place, uh, right now they quote, they are 100% clean of having bad water. There has been no, um, no results, no sicknesses that have happened after the installation of this system. This is what it looks like. Uh, the system, as it starts to accumulate uh, some of the debris from the water itself, this is one that has not been well maintained. One of the uh, systems that here, and the gentleman that's going to take a look at this, will instruct the people on how best to keep it clean and well maintained. You start by taking the water out, the bad water, you agitate the uh, gravel and sand, and then that removes the excess sediment from the top of the water itself. And then as new water comes in, it gets cleaned up as the system goes. This is what it looks like if, as water is uh, put back into it. This is an effective one. Now this one here, was a second system, another one that we took a look at. And as you could see from the picture, this one actually has been well maintained. And this is what we take a look at when we see if in fact they are being maintained well. Uh, as you would imagine, the water here is quite, uh, quite good. Nobody has been getting sick from this water. This is the water that comes out of the pipe. This is the one that was originally starting at the tank itself up on top of the mountain. As you can see, it's uh, fairly cloudy. This is uh, kind of normal in this area. Unfortunately, there's not clear water. One of the fortunate advantages of having water that's murky or cloudy like this is the fact that the people of the village not being able to uh, see or recognize bacteria or microbes within the water could see that there's something happening with the water. And so they are willing to take the chance to make sure that the water then is filtered through cleanly. And uh, that is our advantage. A lot of times I've been into areas where the water is clear, 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 yet it's grossly contaminated with bacteria. And people won't believe us when we tell them that that's infected water. Another one of the systems that's working, as you can see, the community itself is very rustic. There are areas all through these mountains uh, that have homes. Some of them are in concrete, some of them are not. Some of them have dirt floors. Some of them have no walls at all. Uh, this one is one of the nicer homes in this area. And uh, again, one of the advantages of the water system there is that they have clean drinking water pretty much all the time. This is uh, the younger girl. Her charge actually is to make sure that the water system is kept clean. She actually works with her parents and her job is to make sure that the water is maintained the filters are maintained and that she is the one that fills the water on a daily basis. Here's the result. The overall result is the water that you can see there. The people there are very cautious. They are educated. Uh, we spend time actually teaching them sanitation and hygiene to make sure that they are handling the water efficiently and effectively. As you can see here, the, uh, the countertops, the water itself, everything in place is immaculate. They do an excellent job of keeping it clean. And this is what we look for. Um, you'll also notice in the background that there's no window in, in, that, uh, <laughs> in the opening. Oftentimes, because it's a very tropical area, there's no need for windows. Rain comes down usually in sheets. And uh, uh, there again, it doesn't go sideways. It doesn't go lateral. Now we've seen the inside. I want to show you what the outside of some of these homes look like. 
This is um, one of the houses. I'm going to take you through a small tour of some of the areas in the houses we actually take, took a look at and inspected. Of the 500 houses, I probably took a look at about 10% of them on a random selection. And uh, well, not completely random. I would say some of them were so far down the mountain or up the mountain, they decided to pass on those because I would have run out of daylight. So these are the ones that are fairly close to uh, proximity of where we can get in by four by four. My team, uh, these are Rotarians, guiding us through some of the villages up in the mountainous areas. Uh, we are going from house to house, taking a look at and seeing if in fact the systems were uh, maintained properly, if the hygiene and education of those places has been maintained, and if they understand what we are trying to accomplish with this. Another one of the houses, as you can see, um, pretty much they do with what they have there. Again, a beautiful area. This house we couldn't see from 50 feet away because it was so forested in. But as we got closer, we could take a look at and see that, in fact, that these houses were inhabited. You'll notice also on this picture that there's a chimney in the middle of that house, a very small chimney, putting out a limited amount of smoke. One of the projects that Rotary has also um, taken on is using eco stoves, stoves that do not pollute nearly as much of the interior of a house as would be normal. These stoves are very effective. They stay hot for a long time. If you get close to them and actually touch the stove itself, you will not be burnt. It stays at room temperature. All of it's internal because of the um, insulation of those um, fireplaces and the way they're designed and built. The chimney itself takes the smoke out, whereas before, the smoke would actually be released within the house. There is no chimneys uh, in place before the Eagle Stove project was installed. Again, uh, these gentlemen were with me. Um, I will show you and introduce you to them later on in the show, but uh, they spent the time, actually four days with me up in these jungles to take a look at and evaluate the systems that they had put in place. They are very proud of the projects they've done. Um, the gentleman whose back is to us right now is actually a doctor. He's an internist and he had to thank us for what we have done and made possible without, throughout these mountainous regions. One of the other homes, as you can see, um, there's no lack of water, but there is lack of clean water. So we saw laundry being uh, washed everywhere. Every house does laundry outside. Um, unfortunately, it rains every day also. So oftentimes the clothes stays out in the rain or comes in if it's dry enough to bring in. But it is definitely a very humid area. One of the other houses, as you could see, uh, because of the moisture, you've got algae growing on houses and everything else you could think of. Uh, food, by the way, is very prevalent. Uh, there's a lot of the uh, tropical fruits. Bananas grow right alongside of the house. Coconut trees are um, often right there also, along with coconut, I I'm sorry, with um, coffee beans. Each house has a number of coffee bean plants that they use to uh, harvest. Oftentimes they eat them and they also sell the excess that they don't need. You'll see pigs and uh, chickens throughout the, the area also, and this is their daily food supple. Um, picture here of one of the people uh, that have been fortunate to not only get water, the stove, but also a little bit of assistance as far as education. And uh, you could see by the changes over the years, back behind you, you could see one of the houses of the old uh, system. Oftentimes, that's what they had. Now that there's water and uh, efforts put in place, you can see the economy actually starting to improve within these, these villages. And villages are starting to grow, not in size, but as far as houses. The houses become a lot more um, uh, livable, a lot less primitive. Speaking of primitive, uh, here's one of the uh, houses. Uh, this gentleman was definitely the engineer type. You'll see he has outdoor plumbing. Uh, this is uh, his wash area, his bathing area, and his shower. Behind you in that plastic area for um, somewhat privacy is the actual latrine that he's dug. Um, so that would be his outdoor area. Um, along right next to it is actually the house that he lives in, the uh, sheltered area. But this is uh, one of the nice view areas. He's got a million dollar view with about a $500 uh, house. 
Here's one of the examples of one that is uh, a house that has not been uh, converted to an eco stove. As you can see, the smoke is coming out of every direction of that, uh, that roof. And the reason for that is because the actual exhaust from the, ch from the fireplace and the stove goes right directly into the house. Inside of that is all uh, sooted up. Um, and yes, there are a lot of issues with uh, respiratory problems with children, and especially in the younger age. As they get older, you can imagine it only gets worse. This picture I took along the, the roadway, and I apologize for the little blurry uh, stick in the front, but I caught this picture because if you could notice to the middle um, left-hand side of that picture, there's a concrete structure. That is actually a latrine that has built, been built as part of a project. One of the leading problems, and the reason why Rotary takes a look at water projects in conjunction with sanitation, is because we are trying to bring awareness that not having a sanitation system in place is going to create more pollution, not only on the surface water, but also in the groundwaters. So um, as we do water projects, the next step will be to bring in latrines and a sanitation system that will then protect the rest of the watersheds and uh, water itself in the basins. As we drove around, uh, one of the fascinating parts of this area, uh, the, the forest, is that when we, every time we stopped, we would have kids run out from the jungles. We had no idea where the houses were. Uh, I'm, I'm sure some of the Rotarians did, but we really didn't. Uh, the two children here came running out. They were yelling and screaming and cheering for us because the Rotarians actually, every time they go up the mountain, will bring them little treats. They, they bring them uh, instant water, uh, I'm sorry, instant milk. And so they use the milk as one of the uh, nutritional um, efforts that they have there. So the kids come running down looking for the milkman. This is uh, one of the vehicles that I took up the mountain. As you could see, um, the rustic houses in the background and the condition of the roads. This was one of the times of the year where the actual road itself was uh, very passable. Um, I heard stories of a year ago where it had rained straight for 30 days and the roads had all washed out. Um, these people were cut off for as much as a month uh, without having the, being able to get down that mountain. Fortunately, most of them grow their own food, so uh, they're very industrious in that way and were able to handle it quite well. The picture doesn't show it, but this is a pretty steep uphill. We are going downhill, they are coming uphill. We had to back up, and if you could see the mud on it, it was very slick, very slippery. It took us a while to get back up that mountain. Um, the uh, cow there actually kind of coaxed us along. He was walking as fast as we could. Talk about rain. Again, it rained every day there. This picture was taken from one of the homes. Uh, we decided to hold out a bit. It took us 10 minutes before we could actually get to those vehicles because we would have been literally drenched in that rainstorm. Uh, fortunately, we got out. Uh, when I say fortunate, with another probably hour there on top of that mountain, we would not have been able to get through some of the river crossings that we had to cross and also get up some of those slick mountains that you saw. A uh, number of the water crossings, we have those water crossings coming in. Again, with it raining every day in a tropical forest, creates a beautiful landscape, but pretty harsh travel uh, experience. We went all on 4x4s. We actually took seven 4x4s up to the top of this mountain. This picture here, uh, you can see it's a pretty a beautiful uh, stream area, but right in the dead center of that picture, and I don't know if we could zoom in on that one, is a family doing laundry, taking care of their laundry in the middle of that river. And that is one of the issues that we have to have, part of the educational process. This water is one of the main tributaries to the uh, San Pedro uh, Sula, so we have to maintain caution and make sure that the people above actually know what it takes to keep water clean. Another one of the projects, and this is getting slightly off track, but because we are on a project, taking a look at water projects, the gentleman who was the president of the Club of San Pedro Sula is a dentist. He's also an instructor at the university, and he decided, well, since we're going up the mountain, we might as well do a dental clinic to one of the villages there. He took with him 30 students, uh, dental students, to do a dental clinic, actually, in this small village. 
There were 75 people that came out to get their teeth worked on, and uh, they're, they're definitely rough. Uh, when I say rough, uh, I saw quite a few teeth extractions occur during this uh, little clinic. <laughs> so it, it's another rough way of living, but the students themselves did quite well with that. This is inside. They actually did the clinic inside of a school classroom. And so all of the chairs became dental chairs, and the students themselves took a look at uh, each of the uh, patients, clients, I would say, and what they needed as far as getting things taken care of. They do this on an annual basis. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to get up the mountain, so it is an annual basis. The uh, students themselves all volunteer. This is part of what they do. The doctor also is a volunteer. The Rotarians are the one that travel them up the mountain, get them up there. One of the eco stoves I wanted to have you take a look at, this is one that's uh, operational. If you notice, the sides are done in what it looks like brick. Um, there's no heat that escapes off the sides or back. Inside, uh, this is one of the, uh, ge this gentleman here is basically the mayor of this village, uh, of, this, of this small village of about 200 people, 300 people. And uh, because the clinic was being done in his area, he offered to host us for a lunch. So we had lunch there with him. And uh, some of you wonder about traveling around the world. No, I didn't get sick here. <laughs> this is one of the areas where, because we had trained him in hygiene, I was uh, feeling fairly safe about the way they handled their food. And I was right, I did not get sick. They had uh, chicken, chicken soup for us, great, great. It looks, uh, it tastes as good as it looks, by the way. It was excellent. These are the uh, students uh, on the old porch uh, having meal, meal there. And uh, right next to you, you can see the tangerine trees hanging from, uh, from there. Again, part of the food that they eat. We talk about rustic, but you know, every window in those houses are a picture window. This is one of the pictures that I took through one of the windows. I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful area. It, it wasn't all pleasure for me. A lot of it was work. This is uh, me working during a rainstorm. Uh, as you can see, I'm guarding my camera, um, talking to one of the Rotarians about some of the um, tools that were used, some of the surveys, and making sure that all of this worked well for each of them. My job also is to make sure that I survey each and every person that I come in contact with to make sure that the expectations that we had given them were met to make sure that the water is safe, drinkable, and that we have documentation for future sustainability of each of these projects to make sure that this project will be working 10, 20, 30 years from now. One of the areas down, and this is down below, this is not in the mountain region, is uh, one of the slums. And I took a picture of this running along the freeway, the highway, and the reason I put this picture in place a lot of times in these developing countries, the water uh, areas right next to a river is, is a slum area. And why is that? Because that area is claimable. In other words, you don't have to have title to that land to live there. If a storm comes, if um, you have a lot of rain, they get washed out. That is the reason why these people live along the riverbanks, knowing that there's a possibility they'll lose everything, but they also don't have to pay rent. I think this is one of the future areas of where we as Rotarians are going to have to look to uh, resolve the issues because this is one of the areas that becomes convenient for people to homestead at a very low level of uh, life. Behind you, this is a village down in the bottom. Uh, up in the mountains, I wanted to show you this picture. This is the, the area of Merindon. One thing uh, that Merindon has done, and I talked to you about that, uh, the moratorium on building, is that anything above 600 feet in elevation is now no longer um, buildable. That has become part of the reserve to protect the watersheds. What else does Rotary do? This picture here is a school that was actually built by hand by the Rotarians in that area. It became a semi-private school, but anybody could come if they apply for scholarships. And this school was actually built, supported, and developed by one Rotary club. Uh, it's amazing. Another thing that they're working on, <laughs> this is pretty fascinating too. This is the backside of a public school. It's a um, grammar school, and these tanks are actually water tank filtering tanks for tilapia fish. 
they actually grow the tilapia, they sell what they don't eat, what they do eat, they actually serve to the school as, as food, as a food staple. So uh, again, uh, being very industrious, very creative. This school, by the way, also grows all of its own food in the gardens behind the school itself. One of the uh, foods that they serve uh, the fish is what's called a moringo, a moringo tree. And these are very high in nutrients and vitamins. This is actually one of the pro projects, this uh, here is a tree growing itself, where we are looking at putting these in areas like Africa, where it takes very little water, but this plant itself actually has enough vitamins, nutrition, and minerals in it to sustain life comfortably. In other words, you can eat this and have a daily source of vitamins just from eating a few of these leaves. This is the team uh, that was the Rotarians that hosted me. Um, the gentleman to my right is the incoming governor, uh, Carlos Flores, who is also a member of the club. The gentleman behind me is uh, Ramon Gonzalez, who is the dentist who runs the clinics. Um, the gentleman in front of him is um, Maximilian Morales, who is the coordinator of the project. And to his left is uh, Dr. Jose Interiano, who is an internist. These, all five, uh, four of them are Rotary members of this one Rotary Club. The clinic that you see behind them was actually paid for by their club. They did a fundraiser where um, they sold two tickets to, and a trip for two to the uh, World Cup games in Brazil for soccer. Uh, that netted them $15,000. They used all of that money, 100% of that money, to buy a clinic in the, um, it's a bus station there, the terminal, bus terminal that comes into San Pedro Sula. And uh, they furnished all of the uh, insides with a clinic, a dental clinic and an eye clinic. And they also staffed that with um, minor amounts, small amounts coming from the people that come in. They're asked to pay $2 for the service, which covers basically the medicines. And then the rest of it is all covered by the Rotary Clubs. So one of the outstanding things. Now, what was different from this program, and I wanted to share this with you, is uh, we've been looking at community development, serving our communities. I brought this example up because this is one of the clubs that I've seen around the world that has really changed, changed the world completely, making a huge difference in what we do around the world. And because of Rotary, I think um, this is what makes it possible. Everywhere I go in the world as, as Rotarian, and I've been very fortunate to travel to a number of countries, uh, have I been able to see this kind of effort? And it, it's outstanding everywhere we go. And uh, Santa Barbara is no different from that. I would like to say that in closing, one of the ideal efforts that we as Rotarians have, we are um, 1.2 million members worldwide. We cover over 200 countries. And in each and every one of those countries, we make a huge difference in the world. And that is because of that networking, that partnership. So with that, thank you very much. We hope to see you again next week. <laughs>